Okay, hello everybody. This webinar is originating from the city of Vancouver, which is founded on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. Hello, my name is Sophie King, and I'm the Professional Learning and Events Coordinator. Welcome to Pecha Kucha 2019 PIBC Style. Over the year, we put on about 10 webinars, and they all deal sometimes with um, very serious topics, such as climate change, um, flooding, wildfires, and other catastrophes. So we thought for this webinar, we would lighten things up. And uh, in view of the holiday season, we thought we would have a little fun. We will also be drawing for a number of prizes throughout the webinar. We have things such as stainless steel travel mugs, travel mugs, water bottles. We have um, Starbucks gift coupons for coffee or tea or whatever you'd like. And my favorite, our cheeky planning t-shirts. We also have a group registration, which we will be drawing for. Uh, towards the end of the webinar for our 2020 webinar, the first one of, of the season, that is called the Annual Provincial Planning Outlook, Strategic Statistics to Get the Job Done, featuring our keynote speaker, Ryan Berlin from Rennie. And also thanks to our sponsors, Urban Systems and the Real Estate Foundation, for making it possible for us to offer this webinar to you for free to thank you for your continued support over the year. And uh, we've had over a thousand viewers from all over British Columbia, the Yukon, and some parts of Canada, as far away as Dalhousie University, watching our webinars. So thank you very much. We, we appreciate your support. And finally, we have a uniquely wonderful panel lined up for you today. We have Jane Jacobs. And yes, she is still around. We have Plan Girl, and you probably know her or read her articles from our Planning West magazine. And finally, we have the one and only Michael Geller, urban commentator and housing guru. So now we are going to draw for our first prize. And to help me, I am going to invite Dave Crosley in, our executive director. Dave, would you like to come in? Hello, Dave. Hello. How are you today? I'm good. Hello, Thank everyone. Thank you for joining us. You're going to have the job of closing your eyes and picking a number. And I have everyone numbered, and we will draw for our water bottle. OK, just pick a random number. A random number between 1 to 100. 1 to 100. OK, great. All right, I'm going to go with number 48. 48. Let's see, 48 is Leonard Selecki with the Ministry of Transportation. Congratulations, Leonard. So I'm going to write that down, 48. So Leonard, if you're there, could you please type? There you go. I see you're typing. Congratulations. We'll send you a water bottle. Dave, could you do one more draw for me, please? Sure. All right, one more. One more random number. Let's go with number 74. Number 74. And number 74 is, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Sudan Sanita with the Regional uh, District of Central Kootenai. Sudan Sanita with the Re Regional District of Central Kootenai. If you're there, Sudan, please uh, type in that you're there, and we will go from there. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Dave. All right, congratulations. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that, Sunita. Sunita is your first name. Okay, never mind. We will send you the water bottle, Sunita. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so now we're ready to begin. I would like to welcome Jane Jacobs. Jane, please turn on your webcam and your mic. Well, hello. The 
the water is good out here. Wow. I have also I have always known you as the woman that you, who thought that cities should be fun. Now, Jane. Well, they can be very, very fun. They can be very fun, and I'll tell you, it's fun up here. Everybody, I, I'm so glad I, I, for a bit of a luddite, this isn't easy for me, but thank you so much, uh, uh, Sophie, for inviting me down. Uh, it, it's been a while. Uh, I'm calling you here from the great blue yonder in front of the pearly gates, as it were. Uh, I was invited to dial in and just let you know what all us retired, and I mean retired, planners are, uh, are talking about. You know, we, we hang out in the Celestial Martini Bar up here, and who knew it could be so darn good. Hey, P Peter, could you give me another one of those blue martini things that you make? Oh, God, thank you so much. You're an absolute doll. You're a saint, quite frankly. <laughs> Literally. It's, sorry, it's not. It's Peter. I, I, can't, I get you all mixed up. Anyway, actually, it's all about the olives. That's what it's all about. I just want to talk with you a little bit about, uh, we'll get these things started here. I'm going to break things down to about uh, four different ideas here. One is, really, are we still working on these things? And then another category where it's, uh, well, I really did not see that coming. Uh, and then there's another little category of things that falls into the category of uh, kind of makes my stomach turn. It's just it's not looking good for you. And uh, But of course, uh, we're going to end up on something that's a little more hopeful because actually I am an optimist despite my last book of Dark Days Ahead. That wasn't really kind of my, it was a bit of a dip in my happiness cycle, uh, but uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell you things that make my heart sing, which is great, because I have to tell you, there's a lot of choir practice up here, and it's mandatory. You can't get, a, you just can't get out of that choir practice. Okay, so let's just move on. Let's get on with this one under the category of really, are we still working on these things? Uh, this one here. Okay. This has been going on since, well, as they say around here, Jesus was walking the earth. And I guess you could actually say when Jacobs was walking the earth, because when I was in New York City as a, as a rabble rouser, we were battling the destruction of all these beautiful and old and sometimes not so beautiful, let's just be quite frank about it. But they had character, but we didn't have a clever word for it. Now we have come to love this, I love a good portmanteau. I think, uh, I think this renoviction thing that you've come up with, it's got legs, you know? I mean, you know, um, you know, maybe this, this portmanteau, this, this renoviction term is actually going to put a nail in the coffin of this urban scourge that's been around forever. I mean, maybe we should come up with some other portmanteaus for some other things that are bugging me, like this, your bloody nose signs. People, good Lord. Oh, sorry, God. I just, I have to have it. I have to break. But honestly, how in heaven are we supposed to nature chaos, nurture the chaos and the ballet of the of the sidewalk with all these no signs. I mean, I we need a good portmanteau. That's what I'm thinking. And I'm thinking, well, I'm just going to spitball here, but what if we put the word proliferation together with forbidden, and uh, I, I've written it down here, it will be called a proliferbidden. Yeah, that doesn't really work. It's not, that doesn't, okay, we don't, all right, that's not my challenge. All right, the next thing here. Uh, daylight savings time, really are we still having this conversation for heaven's sake? You know, there's something quite sweet, you know, about all the fuss that happens twice a year around the panic of losing an hour and the, the excitement of getting a bonus hour in the spring and brings us all together and it gives us something to talk about that's not the weather or Donald Trump, oh, geez, sorry, God, I know, I'll put a quarter in the square jar, for God's sake, I, I just get so confused, but anyway, but here's the thing, soon enough, daylight savings time, we won't even notice it anymore, because all our clocks are digital, and, they're, and our watches, and our phones, and everything's going to be digital, and we're not even going to notice that there's the time change, and so just drop this debate, it's a distraction, don't spend another minute on it. Let's go on to some other things. You know, speaking of, of, uh, of daylight, 
I understand that safety audits are coming back in to fashion, and I'm all for community walkabouts. Don't get me wrong. Um, and this trend that's coming around, it's all about writing. Some genius has figured out that night represents 50% of a day. Well, that's some mathematics. But let's, you know, suddenly the light bulb goes off, literally, that we need to start talking about lighting. But I'll tell you what bugs me about this one is they're talking about it as lighting is gender neutral. That is a lie. Lighting is, nothing is gender neutral. For gosh sakes, how why is it that everything and initiative gets co-opted and dumbed down and we try to develop a plan that's one size fits all? That is not a thing, people. Lord, Dr. and Jesus, oops, I did it again. I'm sorry. I honestly, I'm sorry. I don't mean to do that. It's completely tiresome that we're, uh, that we're having this, building these environments designed for people who don't live in the very place that they're designing for. Oh boy, this is definitely turning into a rant. Let's, uh, let's move on to something else here. Uh, let's, let's talk about things that I did not see coming. All right, here's one thing. Can we, uh, can we have a little chat about these robots that are delivering cheap crap to people's homes to save them from the burden of shopping at a real store? You know, I get it. It's eyes on the street. Technically, I think there is cameras in there. Eyes on the street. AIs on the street. Eyes on the street. Yeah, it's not that funny. Okay, there's a lovely guy up here who has the saying, if you meet Buddha on the road, kill him. And I say... If you come across one of those robots on the sidewalk, kick it to the curb. Okay, a chocolate? Really? I guess that's a portmanteau as well, but they're using it for evil. Not good. This crackpot, Elon Musk, what the heck kind of a name is, is Elon Musk anyway? It's not like a cologne that's going to rank. You know, and he's built this thing bulletproof, which actually is probably a very good idea because if I was down there, I'd be taking pot shots at that thing all the time. You know, I know those drivers are comfortable in that thing, but are the pedestrians comfortable? Are the cyclists comfortable? Absolutely not. God, my heart rate's going up. Peter, honey, my martini. My martini's dry. Get me another one. Thank you. Mm. All right. God. Here we go. What else are we going to talk about here? Oh, this one here. This was... I, okay, you know, I'm just saying, I'm an old lady. In my days, it was ladies and men and gentlemen and pink and blue and, oh, Lordy, I didn't, I didn't even know. I didn't even, hadn't even heard of this word binary. I just learned that word from some of the youngins up here and I just wasn't getting it. I wasn't getting it. And then they showed me this cartoon of about a sport. Can I tell you? It just hit me. I finally got it. I finally understand it. And so now I really get it, and I'm very happy for it. And, you know, as the old saying goes, God closes one door and she opens another, you know. So, but then again, of course, I guess it would be they opened another, which is, uh, you know, because God is not binary, is not non-binary, and also, um, also God probably plural as well. So it's really a win-win. I'm very excited about that. It's a good thing what's going on. You know, who would have thought there'd be an opera about my epic fight with Robert? I'm very intrigued with this when it finally comes around. Well, I think they've been working on it for 10 years. But um, by the way, I was hanging out with my nemesis in one of the social events here. And I have to say, he's a bit of a mensch. He's not a bad guy. But then I realized it was the wrong Moses. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move on to things that... Uh, that are just, you know, well, let's just say kind of dick moves, really. Uh, let's just talk about this little problem here. Facadism. Who in creation came up with this God-forsaken idea? Anything for the almighty dollar, right? I know this is a bit divisive. I know that I'm preaching to the converted for some of you, and some of you are just playing the devil's advocate on this issue. But let me tell you, Facadism is an abomination, and that's all I have to say about that. What else have we got? Oh, this one might be a little bit touchy, but, uh, you know, I want to talk about NIMBY neighborhood associations. They are now becoming the bastions of whiteness and privilege and explicit bias. People, if we are not careful, the very thing we Jacobians fought for, citizen planning, 
control from below and support from the above. And let me just say, now that I'm up here, you have a lot of support from above. You know, it's being threatened. There's a little thing called inclusiveness, people. Even you folks in Victoria, I know you have some diversity hiding in some of your neighborhoods over there, in the cooler neighborhoods, of course. All right, let's move on to uh, modular housing. Really? This is a thing? This is your A game? How is this community? I see an industrial park where the great unwashed are being warehoused. Oh, my Lord, what is that? Although this one here, this I love, the idea of having gardens in those containers. And I just want to let you know I threw this slide in for all the, for all the Ministry of Agriculture people who, who signed in onto this. I love that you guys came to this. Love the professional diversity. It makes us all better planners, doesn't it? <laughs> all right, let's just get hopeful for a second, shall we? All right. I am hopeful about reconciliation. Lord knows indigenous people have had the patience of Job. In fact, we're even doing our part here with experimenting with co-governance. I saw God and the great creator, I think down there in Coast Salish territory, they call, call them Hales. Uh, they're over there talking about decolonizing heaven. Uh, and I can see that there's, there's some kinks that they're working out, obviously, and I can see the same thing happening down there. Uh, I can see the movement is struggling. There's some very, very good words, but, but not much follow through. Planners, allow me to gently remind you, the personal is political. Bring your whole self to your workplace. Decolonization is a practice. Huh? There's no blueprint for undoing the harms. You have to make it up as you go along. But for sure, you have to speak truth to power. I talk to God all the time, just straight up, one-on-one, -on -one, mano a, no, no, not mano. Okay, so we, uh, we, we really need to speak truth to power, and you need to step up as accomplices. This is a word some of the young people have been telling me. It's better than an ally, an accomplice, okay? The other thing I'm kind of crazy about, Rainbows! I love your rainbow crosswalks. We got a lot of rainbows up here, and it makes me so happy to see some of those rainbows down in the pedestrian realm. It just, it just, it just absolutely gives me a tickle. And then finally, I just want to share with you, you know, call me late to the game, but uh, I've just gotten into podcasts, and I'm uh, the Wi-Fi up here. It's, it's incredible, and it's free. And so uh, I've been listening to some of these podcasts, and this third wave feminism, or urbanism thing, you know, these young women, they've got a lot to say. I think they're social anthropologists, which is maybe why I like them, because I think that's my background is being you know, an anthropologist as well. But I'm very impressed with their perspective. They say that uh, first wave urbanism, well, that would be sort of the Citizen Jane, the, you know, they're very kind to throw me a bone around that, saying that the, that's when citizen planning took shape, and that's, that's very lovely. And then there was the second wave, which is when the profession kind of grew some roots, and uh, different movements emerged. They, they, they kind of got branded a little bit, you know, like smart growth, and new urbanism, and the 8 to 80 movement, and the livable cities, and the happy cities, and, and and that's all good, but now it's the third wave. This is what they're talking about. And they're talking about getting back to the social fabric, which I was talking about around, uh, what was that, I don't know, 70, 50, 70 years ago? The social fabric, but they got better words for it. They got equity. They got inclusiveness. They got justice. They got, uh, they got systemic bias, and they even talk about racism. We didn't like talking about racism. And they talk about this thing about intersectionalism. Intersectionalism? They have people telling you to bring all your identities to the table. I think it's absolutely marvelous. Here's an example I heard them talking about, about cyclists. You don't call people cyclists anymore. You call them people who ride bikes. Come on, I think that's good. So I'm very excited about this third wave, and I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion that's going to happen around the, 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 uh, the planning tables. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Thank you, Mother Teresa. That was very kind of you to listen in. Okay. Finally, I'm going to take this baby home. Happy Hanukkah. 
I think that uh, in my tradition, we wish you happy Hanukkah, Naskodal Hayasham, that a great miracle has happened here today. And, you know, for me, a Luddite being on the, on the internet and the worldwideness, it's quite a, it's quite a miracle. But here I have eight wishes for my fellow planners, okay? I wish for you many more rainbow crosswalks in your communities. That your cities are magnets for compassionate developers who don't displace their residents. Well, I hope Elon Musk takes a bus ride and has an epiphany, and then he puts all his focus into mass transit, making it sexy and irresistible, and he probably wouldn't have to make it bulletproof either. Maybe we call it Musk Transit. What do you think about that, you Ministry of Transportation people? Musk Transit. Okay. Um, I wish for you workplaces and neighborhood associations and friendships that are diverse and inclusive and representative. And I hope that you find the holy grail of third-way urbanism and accept the gospel of intersectionalism into your plans and policies. Can I have another hallelujah? Wouldn't that be something? I hope you are able to take a leak in a public bathroom and that you feel safe. That would be nice. I hope you receive lovely artisanal gifts that are delivered to you in person. And finally, I wish you lots and lots of latka in the new year. Lots of, that's a pun, latka, lots of, lots of luck. Okay. Over and out! Thank you, Jane. One second here. Thank you, Jane. You still have it. Stay with us, and we'll bring you on at the end for a bit of a discussion. And now... We will be drawing for our second prize. This is Nina Schmidt. She's the Manager of Operations from our office. Thank you for joining us, Nina. Thank you for having me here. And Jane Jacobs, very well done. Yeah, you have a great taste to have. <laughs> yeah. um, so we will be drawing for our coffee mugs. So Nina, close your eyes and hold on here. Close your eyes and pick a number between 1 and 100. Um, 33. 33. Okay, 33. We have Holly Adams with the District of North Vancouver. Holly Adams with the District of North Vancouver. Holly, if you're there, could you type a hello for us? Okay. Thank you, Holly. We will be sending you out a mug. And now for the second one, Nina. Um, Pick another number. Number 10. Number 10. So number 10 is Dan Ward with the City of Coquitlam. Dan, if you're there, could you please let us know? Dan Ward with the City of Coquitlam. Okay, great. Um, one second here. Hmm. If you're having problems with the sound, um, a couple of people are, not to worry. We are recording the session and we will send you the link to a perfectly sounding um, recording and the slide deck. So don't worry about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Happy much. holidays, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the webinar. See you next year. <laughs> okay, and now. We are going to go on to Plan Girl. Plan Girl will share the most out there and unusual planning initiatives that she has seen on her travels and written about in Planning West magazine. So Plan Girl, please turn on your webcam and mic while I work on getting your presentation on. Okay. Just one hello, second. hello. Hello, Plan Girl. What are you planning today? Okay. You're on. I think I'm doing oral interviews for PIBC later. Yeah. That's my okay. idea of a good time. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Jane Jacobs, and thank you, Sophie. Uh, for those of you who don't know Plan Girl, uh, I have been visiting 
all of sorts of interesting spots and bringing the best ideas back to BC and basically using all of my super earnest planning brain cells to bring positivity and inspiration to our urban landscapes, which is obviously not appropriate for a PIBC webinar in this esteemed uh, company. So for this webinar, uh, I'm working to amp up my sardonic honey bone uh, in order to keep our environment safe uh, from the absence of criticism. So we'll just tamp it down on the inspiration a little bit here. Uh, and furthermore, I previously focused on hu non-humanoid urbanism, and now I'll draw a broader perspective, um, having digested this field guide uh, to humans and where to find them in their natural environment. So the first theme that I will explore with you today is urbanism in the age of social media. And the first image that I'd like to share with you, uh, this is actually a photo from Hudson Yards in New York City, uh, which the Garden newspaper has dubbed the billionaire's playground, um, where a haircut, haircut costs um, $800 and a two-level duplex costs $32 million. We'll set you back $32 million. So um, also known as a hot mess and a montage of buildings um, that are, quote, like chubby fowl engaged in their first awkward mating ritual. So that's Hudson Yards for you. And in particular, in this photo, in the foreground, you'll see a structure that is dedicated to selfies um, with a lattice of 2,500 photo ops woven together in a vertical panopticon. And um, there was a public naming competition for this structure recently. And my favorite entry um, for this competition was the name Meat Tornado uh, for this selfie-driven spectacle. Uh, and my partner and I had a great trip with our kids um, last year to Vietnam, really great time. Um, but we did make the mistake of taking the advice of a taxi driver um, who told us the top destination that we must not miss in Vietnam uh, was a place called uh, Bana Hills. Uh, so even though we hadn't researched it ahead of time, we did go there for a day. And what we found was a completely um, fake village um, made of cementitious wood uh, cementitious rock, cementitious everything, it populated entirely by tourists and the poor staff that were serving us. Um, and this photo depicts a bridge that goes from nowhere to nowhere, um, with tourists trying to get the perfect selfie on it and sort of um, elbowing each other, forcing each other, maybe paying each other off to get um, out of the frame for that selfie photo. So what have we come to? Uh, not too long ago, we experienced um, the city using each of our five senses. And in fact, a flaneur is a keen-eyed stroller who chronicles the minutiae of city life. The sights, the smells, the sounds. Um, and now uh, we're fixated on the sense of sight, and particularly uh, as mediated through a lens. And at least this fellow uh, is using a real camera. Um, but many people now are traveling with, to capture selfies and other Instagrammable moments. And an article from Vice magazine um, in 2018 identified that over 250 people have died in the pursuit of the perfect selfie. Um, dubbed now selfie sides, and planners are actually being asked to create selfie-free zones uh, in order to save people from themselves. And several municipalities across the world, actually, um, have banned texting while walking now. Um, and in London, England, some lampposts, if you can believe it, have been padded in order to protect the large numbers of people who are using mobile devices um, while walking. Ouch. Uh, have you heard of the Murphers in Byron Bay, Australia? Uh, Murphers are mums who also surf. 
Uh, and there was this fascinating article in the July issue of the Vanity Fair magazine, um, and it was called The Coast of Utopia. And the article is about this group of women who branded themselves on social media. Uh, they've been drawn to each other from different places in the world. They amplify one another. They follow one another on Instagram. Their followers follow each other's followers. Um, and they're actually driving up the cost of homes in certain places, like Byron Bay. Um, and they support uh, Instagrammable urban design. They monetize nature and public spaces uh, with this social media empire. Um, they wear organic cotton and hemp, and they dress their kids in it too. Uh, they curate this slow-paced lifestyle, um, but with a series of frenetic photo shoots um, for their blogs. And they are not beyond uh, commodifying their pets as well. Um, but don't worry. Um, I'm sure this dog is getting plenty of love. Uh, and it's probably even getting homeschooled. So my next theme is urbanism in the age of hipsters. So here is one of them in their natural in environment, in their natural habitat. Uh, note the striped shirt, the facial hair, um, the laptop, the caffeine delivery device, the cobblestones, the orthopedic shoes, um, the strategically placed bike. Yes, yeah, so I'll tell you a bit more about hipsters. Craft beer and urban bird watching, oh yeah now a thing. A whole new generation of bird nerds um, are keen on wildlife watching in our cities and our towns. Basically another avenue, I think, for tongue-in-cheek humor. Uh, and a few years ago, I went on an under-40 Urban Development Institute tour of Portland, a UDI not really being known as a hipster organization, and yet all of the Portland developers who were presented to us on this tour looked exactly like this guy. So planners, can you imagine trying to uh, negotiate community amenity contributions with this fellow across the table from you? How tough would that be? I think I'd probably be buying him beard balm as a Christmas gift or something. Um, so I'd already explained how there's this one large group of people uh, who is working extraordinarily hard to get gorgeous Instagrammable photos and selfies, and that's their main focus. At the same time, there's this rise, there's a parallel universe and a rise of people who are not looking for beauty. Um, they're looking only for ironic things to photograph, the, the more sarcastic, the more sardonic, or tongue-in-cheek the humor, um, the better to capture photos. Now this one, this is not a sarcastic photo. Um, uh, this is deep realism uh, here for you. In addition to the legions of like, avocados being consumed, what this photo is uh, depicting for you is that if you are not getting splinters when you eat a meal, and in terms of the urban environment and as planners, if you are not getting splinters from the street furniture, and your kids are not getting splinters when they use the playgrounds, there's something deeply wrong. You're doing something wrong in 2019. So what else is changing in the urban environment? Well. The No Pants Subway Ride uh, started as a pantless flash mob back in, of course, New York City, um, but it's morphed over time in more of a tongue-in-cheek sort of way. Um, there's a call out for individuals one day of year uh, to take the subway not in groups, but individually and showing no conscious knowledge whatsoever that they're actually pantless. Um, now, luckily, I know that the Planning Institute of BC is a deeply reputable organization as our sponsors for this webinar. So I had wanted to share a photo um, from the World Naked Bike Ride, but I, I, I just knew that it was completely inappropriate 
um, to sh oh, oh, I, how did that get in there? Um, okay, uh, so uh, new thing, people. Let's uh, move on here. Uh, urbanism in the name in the age of dog poop. Uh, there are estimated to be about one billion dogs uh, in the world right now, and in North America and Europe. Uh, the ratio of human beings to dogs is six to one. So increasingly, we are working hard to maneuver around dog poop in our urban environments, or indeed uh, failing to do so. So the dog you see was the first animal to be domesticated by humans, um, the noble wolf coming close to humans' fires, um, and now, now the domesticated noble wolf is perhaps um, the largest impact on human environments of any animals, at least within our cities, um, and even infiltrated planners' work plans. So I think, you know, this is my guess, but uh, the 21st century will be known for its great dog park wars. Um, planners from across British Columbia uh, know all too well the fervent ba battles that are happening between on-leash and off-leash um, dog owners and the people that are fighting for dogs to be permitted versus the ones that want the dogs to be prohibited from public spaces. And a variant on these great wars are, of course, the small dog, large dog uh, wars. And I have a question. Is it a planner's job to keep we floofster safe from larger honeykins by building dog parts just for small dogs? Perhaps it now is. So my next theme is urbanism in the age of climate change. It's a really big deal, people. Uh, and I have to apologize for that. That that was my, I promise that was my one and only pun. That was just a nod to my father and my two boys uh, who are deeply dedicated punsters. Um, I promise I don't have any more of those. So anyway, wheels are getting bigger and smaller. Um, there are electric bike, bikes that are whipping past us and taking out wee floofster. Um, there's actually unicycle hockey that's happening uh, a few meters from my house at the Grandview Park. It's a whole new world. Um, we need to plan our communities better to reflect the variety of families out there. Uh, we have been walking away for decades now from the presumption that a family needs to be two straight parents and 2.5 kids. Um, but with climate change, I think we're walking even further and faster um, from these assumptions and presumptions that we've been making. And we need to plan for all households, no matter how small the household or dogs are getting as a result. Now, I'm just, as an aside, and my staff will know this, I, uh, I'm making jo a lot of jokes about small dogs because I find myself in possession of a dog that's not much larger than a chubby rat myself. So just really the first to make fun of myself. So what else is changing in the age of heightened awareness of climate change? Um, this is a photo of Hundert Wasser House. It built in 1985 in Vienna, Austria, um, by an environmentally minded artist. It features undulating floors, a roof covered um, by earth and grass, large trees um, that are actually growing from inside of the rooms, and a total of 250 trees and bushes in all. Um, now, Hundred Foster House was probably ahead of its time in 1985, um, but there's a great deal of architecture and urbanism that's embraced similar ideals. So this is International House in Fukuoka, Japan, um, one million square feet of multi-purpose space, uh, 15 steps of green roof, green walled terraces um, that are utilized for agro-urbanism, relaxation gardens, and even a waterfall. Um, so, oh, dang, uh, I think I slipped a little bit too much into pointing out inspirations from elsewhere. 
and I kind of need to get back to my new goal of scathing critique. Um, so, so I'll get back to that. Here's a sign for an HOV lane in Montreal. Um, what is wrong with this picture? So if you organize yourself with two, let's say two work colleagues, um, maybe one that's always running late and the other one that wears too much um, aftershave, and you squeeze together in one car, or you squeeze together into a bus with complete strangers, um, then you can bypass all of the traffic congestion. But oh wait, uh, if you can afford a taxi or buy a Tesla Cybertruck, um, as Jane Jacobs was talking about, you're kind of scot-free too, or what? Um, so, and in this picture, uh, the electric vehicles, even though there's no charging station there, are getting the same kind of priority as the accessible stalls. Uh, and there are even cases when hybrid drivers get um, priority stalls as well. So really, you can try harder or just pay some hard cash. So very briefly, um, I will also touch on another theme, uh, speaking of building a new world. Um, we're also just busy building. Um, and have any other planners noticed? I find this really fascinating um, that we're surrounding construction sites with huge hoarding, and yet a lot of people, and not just kids, are fascinated by construction. If there are any of those small little windows in the hoarding, they're practically elbowing each other out of the way to look down into the excavation sites or into um, the construction sites. And it, and it might be, this is just my theory, um, there, there are very few heavy industrial sites within our cities and towns anymore. Um, so as, as more we prioritize infill and construction, this is kind of wedging heavy industrial uses into our towns. And of course, in places like cuts and yards um, and elsewhere, it is sometimes the case that a building under construction is much more interesting and sometimes even more attractive than the finished product. So now I'll move on again uh, to the theme of graffiti. Uh, graffiti in many places and in recent times has been really a matter of an ongoing community conversation. Now this is a, an image of graffiti um, from Bristol, England, um, which is a city known for its creative and anonymous stencil uh, graffiti. And this is Colonel Sanders himself serving up some pancakes. And um, I'm not sure if he's turned vegetarian or maybe he's working on a soup kitchen. Uh, and this is one of my fa very favorite images. Um, this is a bow tie along a canal in Lyon, France. Um, and when I first saw it, and every time since when I've looked at this picture, this unexplainably sad bow tie has put a huge smile on my face. It's just such an unexpected, surprising thing to come across in an urban landscape. And um, I think, by the way, um, I think the bow tie is kind of sad about not being used for what it was originally intended for anymore. So that's just my thought. And here's some graffiti closer to home. This is on a sidewalk about one block from my house in East Vancouver. Now, my staff, who I heard are watching today, hello, um, will strongly suspect uh, that it was me that um, interceded with some of my kids' chalk uh, to correct the grammar, but indeed, someone else sadly beat me to it. In uh, East Van Vancouver, we're having conversations all the time on stop signs. That's, that's one of the things we do. Uh, for years, it was stop Harper, and then it would stop the tar sands, uh, stop climate change, stop pipelines, stop pay inequity, and on and on. Um, really, in East Vancouver, there's a lot of entreaty to just stop things. Uh, in Europe, uh, there's not, no less creativity in using the signs, in particular the um, do not enter signs um, that I've really enjoyed. Uh, just a few examples for you um, on this phenomenon of thoughtful or humorous vandalism. 
uh, and this one, this is my very favorite uh, of those stop signs or do not enter signs. The police officer uh, obviously has a bit of a fetish for law enforcement. So, uh, just as the tr signs say, the, the trail never ends. But you may be asking, uh, is this the end of your presentation plan, girl? Why, yes, it's almost the end. Uh, I do have some young plan girls and young plan boys to train up um, for in the next generation, so I do have my work to do, but I'm also close to the end of this presentation. But um, I do have one more gratuitous slide, a shameless one-liner. Have you heard of the BC Realtor who wanted to get the highest number of cold calls in the province and had their name changed to Land Assembly? Thank you, fine girl. But um, oh. That's great. Okay, and that's a wrap. You're a lot of fun, and we'll see you again at the end of uh, Michael's presentation. Before Michael goes on, we're going to do another draw, and this time it's going to be for our cheeky t-shirts. We'll have two. I'm going to close my eyes and think of a number, um, 99. I'm going to go with number 99. So let's see. Number 99 is Andrew Stewart Jones. He's a VIU student. Andrew Stewart Jones, VIU student. I can picture you in this t-shirt. Whoop, this t-shirt. So Andrew, if you're there, can you let us know? Oh, Andrew is typing. Hey, thank you, Andrew. That's great. I will pick another number now. Um, I'm going to go with one. So let's see. Who was the first person to register? Ah, Graham Farstad with Arlington Group. Graham, if you're there, would you kindly let us know? Graham? Are you there? I'll give you three seconds, Graham. One, two, three. Okay, we'll go with another number. Um, how about 98? Let's go down to 98. 98 is Kendra Taylor with Urban Systems. Kendra Taylor with Urban Systems, are you there? Hi, okay. Thanks, Kendra. Great. And now we will go on, continue with our webinar. And now to the girl of all things housing, Michael Geller. Hello, Michael. Oh, can you turn on your audio? Click on your, uh, your microphone. There you go. Okay. Hopefully everybody can hear me now. There's a lot of feedback there, isn't there? Is this any better? Okay. Um, well, those are two very difficult acts to follow, but I'm going to do my best. Since we're approaching the holiday season, I thought I would prepare a presentation based on a Christmas card. And Sophie says I can advance these slides. Can you turn down your uh, microphone a, a tad more? There's a, a little bit of an echo. So I think you all know what a Pecha Kucha is. Um, I'm supposed to speak for 20 seconds about 20 slides. Um, I'm afraid I have 32 slides, so this will take a little bit longer. Uh, some of you may have seen this card a number of years ago. I put forward 
10 uh, ideas for the first 10 months of Christmas or the first 10 days and then uh, a couple more. What I'd like to do is, are you all getting this feedback? I'm not sure, Sophie, is it possible to cut this out? Anyway, what I will do is quickly run through the first 12 uh, ideas and then we'll take a look at 12 more because sadly, eight years after this presentation, we're uh, still struggling with housing affordability. Many of us grew up in very small houses and yet we don't build them anymore. So for the first day, I'd like to see us allow and in fact encourage more smaller homes and smaller lots. For the second day, it seemed appropriate to look at duplex or semi-detached houses. Again, most of you know these are very common throughout the world, but rarely built in, in, in Vancouver and metro lower mainland or elsewhere around the province. For the third day, uh, an idea that I developed in West Vancouver, I placed three homes on each lot, resulting in a total of nine homes on three lots at 0 0.6 FSR, which attracted 150 letters of objection. But thanks to a 4-3 vote, it was finally built, and today the project Hollyburn Muse is considered a model of gentle densification. Of course, those of you familiar with the city of North Vancouver are well aware that there are many examples of gentle densification, especially around Lower Lonsdale. But here's something that's very hard to find. Individually owned fee simple row houses. Many people want to live in a townhouse but they don't want to be in a condominium. Here's an idea for them. Another thought. Why aren't we building small apartment buildings like this one I found in Calgary with six suites on three floors integrated into a single family neighborhood? This is an idea whose time has come. Similarly, in Seattle, six townhouses on a 50-foot wide lot with a central parking access. They call them the six-pack. One of the things you find throughout Toronto are stacked townhouses. They're a perfect alternative to the three or four-story apartment, and yet, there are very few examples throughout British Columbia. We're starting to see some on the North Shore, some in Burnaby, and 45 years ago, we built some on the South Shore of False Creek. I urge you to explore this idea and create zoning that will encourage it, or as a minimum, permit it. It's not just housing forms that can create affordability. There are many financing options. Shared equity ownership, which is so common in Europe and even parts of the United States, is an idea that should come to Vancouver. Many of you heard me go on about modular housing. This was my thesis in 1971. I had proposed it during the 2008 election, and it's an idea that finally did get realized. But as I'll show you later, there's great design potential. At Simon Fraser University, we had an opportunity to explore a variety of different housing alternatives. Uh, 
This on the left is the example of the lock-off suite within a suite. A great way to encourage developers to build three and maybe even four bedroom units. On the right, if you look carefully, you will see that by putting a door to the living room, you're able to convert that living room into a second bedroom. Just another approach to creating more affordable housing. Laneway housing has finally become acceptable, but why don't we allow them for sale? And finally, I suggested on the 12th day of Christmas, we should reduce our parking standards. Your minimums should become the maximums. And that would allow the redevelopment of parking lots. So here we are, eight years later, and still needing ideas. So my first one is to think about even smaller housing. Maybe not what this rooming house accomplished on the left, but on the right, for under 400 square feet, two bedroom apartment. Not for everyone, but certainly an, op an option. One of the most affordable forms of housing is the basement suite. But I suspect your municipality doesn't allow them in duplexes or in townhouses. I think you should, not just for rent, but in some instances, in the case of new units, allow them to be sold. Many of us believe we're running out of land. I don't actually believe that. I just don't think we're making the best use of the land we already have. However, for those of you who do worry both about running out of land and also rising sea levels, here's an idea I saw in Germany a couple of years ago. As I said, modular housing offers great potential. Here's an idea for slightly more interesting design aesthetic. And no, don't worry, I'm not actually proposing this. But I am wondering why we don't make better use of rooftops, especially when you look at many of the buildings that have all of this vacant space. I know a number of apartment owners who, if, if they were allowed to build a penthouse on the roof or some more rental units, would willingly consider upgrading the rest of the building. Recently, there's been some discussion about the idea of redeveloping golf courses. I'm not in favor of redeveloping all the golf courses in Vancouver, but I do think it could make sense to sell a strip of land off the Langara golf course fronting along Canby Street. Just think of how much revenue could be developed and devoted to more affordable housing. One of the thoughts that I often get driving around is why we aren't combining housing with the new forms of industrial. As the note says, industry has changed since 100 years ago when we drafted our zoning bylaws. By integrating housing and industrial uses, you could also create more 24-hour vibrancy and bring additional amenities to many of these industrial parks. On the right is an early illustration of a wall financials development along the 900 block of East Hastings Street. Many people say 
if we allow residential to be built with industrial, it will raise the land values and industrial won't be built. This isn't correct. As long as we require the developer to maximize the amount of industrial development on the site, then the residential could be viewed as a bonus. When I was in Germany, I discovered that many balconies had these forms of enclosure, which were retractable, and as you could see, could either be closed, partially closed, or completely opened up. These are not like traditional balcony enclosures in that they're not an exterior wall. Instead, they have small air gaps in order to allow them to open and close easily. But I would like to suggest that this is a very smart way to make many balconies far more usable without significantly impacting the exterior appearance of the building. Furthermore, these systems can reduce noise, they can reduce pollution, and they can improve the energy performance of the balcony. Um, I've been working with a company called Lumen, uh, based in Finland, to try and encourage municipal planners to allow this form of enclosure without the balcony space being included in the FAR calculations. I think it's an idea worth pursuing in the coming year. Another idea, we now have laneway housing. We have an ability to use modular housing. Uh, seven years ago, I proposed, why don't we create laneway apartments and laneway townhouses in multi-zoned or multi-family zoned neighborhoods? Uh, this idea was put forward to the mayor's task force and the West End zoning actually allows it to happen. I think it's just a matter of time. Again, take a look at the vacant parking spaces behind some older apartment buildings. Allow some modules to be stacked either as a temporary or permanent solution. I think it's another way to effectively create free land and in turn, more affordable housing. When I was in the Netherlands, I came across this development just outside of Amsterdam in what was a 1970s new town. Those of you who've been to the Netherlands know that in recent years, the government has imposed a very high degree of design control. One day they said, you know, maybe we should let people feel what they want, provided they meet basic fire codes and healthy safety requirements. So this is what's happened. It's not pretty, but it demonstrates an affordable housing approach which I think could well suit many locations, if not in the West End of Vancouver, in many of the municipalities and regional districts where you're active. We're getting near the end. Over the last few years, I've been involved with the development of heritage properties and I'd like to thank the planners in West Vancouver who have supported these initiatives and allowed infill housing to be built. In this case, a heritage house is divided into two and two infill homes were allowed on a large property. 
The sad irony is that it was easier to get approval for this development than it is to sell it. But this is an approach that I think we should all be looking at to save both heritage and character homes, which sadly are being lost. So finally, how about infilling the front lawns of larger affluent properties in Shaughnessy, elsewhere on the west side? This is an idea that was put forward in a prefab housing competition for which I was a judge. And the proponent recognized that many people would be upset with modular housing on their front lawn or their neighbor's front lawn. So the solution was obvious. You simply design the housing like a giant hedge. How would it work? Well, you simply have a planting strip around the home. And the modules could be brought to the site directly from the factory. And hey, it could be very nice living inside a hedge. Think of all the greenery and the privacy. So hopefully some of these ideas are found to be preposterous, but others are recognized as being sensible approaches to the creation of more affordable homes throughout the province. As it was mentioned before, when it comes to many aspects of life, there is no one size fits all solution. And I think this best illustrates that. Happy holiday. Thank you, Michael. Okay, Sophie, over to you. I could tell that it was killing you not to go 100 miles an hour. Thank you for slowing down so that we could hear you um, among the echo. But it, it sounded pretty good to me because you slowed down. Um, but I, I, I know that you're, you're a lot quicker than that. So thank you very much. Um, great. And now I was going to introduce you to um, the newest member of our group, Kelly Chan, who is the member services coordinator. However, she tricked me and went off to lunch. So. Um, Right now, I have Morgan Colick from the Real Estate Institute of British Columbia with me here, and we share offices. So Morgan is going to choose our last um, draw, and she's going to pick a number from 1 to 47 for the group membership um, for the first webinar in uh, the new year, the, um, the planning, Provincial Planning Outlook Strategic Statistics to get the job done which is a $100 value. Michael, just stay on the line for another 30 seconds. Um, okay, Morgan, close your eyes and pick a number. 1 to 47. Uh, 1 to one to 100. 1 to 100. All right, so I am going to pick 47. <laughs> 47. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. 47 is... Chris, Chris Nichols with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. Chris Nichols, Ministry of Municipal Affairs. So Chris, if you're there, let us know. I see that she is there. Great, okay, so um, we will forward you a free re group registration for our um, webinar in the new year. And now I would like to ask both Plan Girl and Jane Jacobs. Thank you, Morgan, I appreciate your help. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask Jane Jacobs to come on back on board if she's there, and Plan Girl. I'm just waiting for. Hello. So Michael, I think you know Jane. You two go back a long ways, do you not? The the irony is. No, 
what? This is the first time I saw her there. Although I did once live behind her. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Oh. We're going to have to turn your, your um, mic off. It doesn't work too well. But you know what the good thing is, Jane? You can tell Michael what you think without any feedback from him. Well, well, I can't believe he's still alive. Michael, God bless you. Uh, last time I saw you was in Cabbage Town with Marshall McClellan. We were having coffee together. You're looking good, old man. Yeah, you know, Jane, it's probably killing Michael that he can't respond to you. Yeah, well, I, maybe I should load it up a little bit more then while he, while he can't talk. You know, that last slide, Michael, that was uncalled for. I, I'm feeling nauseous. I also thought of a joke. Maybe you could share this, Emily, with your kids. I thought, well, what, if, what do you call somebody who owns too many of those hedge modular Homes, you 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 call him a hedgehog. <laughs> uh. Oh well, thank you, thank you all. That's pretty good, Emily. Any yeah, it's not bad. Hey, hey, Jane, Jane, did you uh, read that article I wrote about you in Horizons magazine? I did, Emily. It blessed your cotton picking art. That was it was just it was just lovely. And of course, it got Jesus all worked up around here because you said, what would Jane Jacobs do? And Jesus' nose was a little out of joint now, but I told him, you know, you were just being playful. Okay, great. Uh, Thank, you, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sue Hallett, for channeling Jane Jacobs. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know who, I don't know this Sue Hallett. I, it, I don't know her. Well, whatever uh, you're doing, keep doing it up there. Um, I, you look great. Um, thank you to Emily Adam for her entertaining observations. Oh, maybe, maybe, um, thank you to Emily and Michael can turn off your uh, microphone. Jane Jacobs, would you mind turning off your microphone for us? Thank you, Emily Eden, for your entertaining observations and commentary on urban living, and to Michael Geller for his unconventional yet thought-provoking ideas on housing and urbanism. And in the spirit of not being mean, I will give Michael one last chance to, to say something. Michael, I'm going to mute my microphone to limit the uh, feedback, and you can say whatever you'd like to say. Michael, remember to turn your microphone on. Turn your microphone on. Michael, turn your microphone on by clicking on the icon. Okay, well, let's try again. I just want to thank all those people who took more than an hour out of their lives to see if Jane Jacobs really is alive and to again witness the creative mind of Emily Aiden. Some of us were privileged to hear her at the recent planning conference. And uh, Sophie, well, I suspect I disappointed a lot of people by not matching the level of humor presented by Jane and Emily uh, I hope there were a few good ideas there. And uh, what I have done is taken my presentation and turned it into this year's holiday greeting card. And I will be sending it out to everyone on your uh, email list in the hope that some of these ideas, especially the sensible ones, will be realized next year and in more years to come. So happy holidays. Thank you, Michael. Maybe turn off your microphone again. There we go. Turn it off. Um, yeah, Michael, I'm sorry, you can never disappoint. So don't worry about that. Thank you, everybody. Now I know um, they can't see you, but let's all give Emily, Jane, and Michael.
some applause for their wonderful presentation. And believe it or not, PIBC members are eligible to claim 1.5 CPL units for this wacky webinar. And we will be sending out a recording um, and the slide deck shortly, so not to worry if there were some sound issues. Thank you again to our sponsors, Urban Systems and the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia for making this free webinar possible. And on behalf of the PIBC staff, whom you've met most of today, I have to have a talk with our new member, Kelly Chan. How dare she go for lunch during her presentation? Just kidding. Um, and we wish you, in whatever way you will be celebrating, a very happy holiday season. And this is the end of the webinar. Thank you all. Bye for now.